Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Monk. I'm a Neo4j consultant. I help uh, customers implement solutions around Neo4j. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk, Visual Cipher. Today, we'll, I'll be showing you um, a tool I've been working on that helps you create, visualize, and parse Cipher. It's more of an emphasis on the visualization and parsing. The, the creation side is, is there a little bit, so I'll show you a little bit of that, but um, it's not as far along as the other stuff. To set the context for why uh, a tool like this um, could be useful, I wanted to show you this slide. This slide I took from the Neo4j Solutions Lab folks. And if, you, if you're not familiar with the, the Neo4j Solutions Lab, it's an offering Neo4j has that uh, essentially uh, we come on site, and not me personally, but let's go Alessandro and there's another, a couple other folks that do it. They come on site and in three to five days, they actually walk you through the complete process of building a graph from scratch with a uh, use case that's centered around your business. Um, so this is the process they go through, and it's a really good uh, slide for showing you the process of building a, a graph from, from scratch. So if you look at the far left, you have a question. Uh, that question, um, you, you start modeling out. You have your business concepts, the things that are important to solve the question. You whiteboard it out. You actually source that data model with existing data you have. Um, then you import the data, you build your query, and at the end, you have a, a real working graph that answers the question. So you have this sort of interplay between, you know, what do I want and then what do I have? And in the middle, you have this model. And we'll point out it's iterative, so that the first time you do it, you're not going to get it right. Uh, probably. But anyway, you, you, it usually takes a few times to get it right, and also you, you go through this process to enhance it as well. So the, this, um, this slide shows you a few of the tools that are in the ecosystem to help you out with this process. Uh, one of which is Arrows, which has been around for a number of years. You may have used it already, or you may have seen its output in some like, excuse me, for instance, Max DeMarzi's uh, blogs, blog post. He has a lot of arrow generated models and stuff like that that he uh, produces to show you kind of what he's doing. It's also DB schema, which shows you the model that exists if you have an existing graph database. And over here on the right, uh, there's our friend Load CSV. And Load CSV is, of course, like the workhorse if you're importing data into uh, the graph. This is uh, where you're going to use to essentially stick data from your source systems into your graph, especially if you're just you know, getting started. One quick note before I get into like the demo, uh, just a quick note on data modeling. You know, Neo4j is a, what they call a um, label property graph. So we have node labels, relationship types, and property keys. And this is just a, a simple example. We have person, company, event. Person works for company, person attends event. If you've used Neo for a while, this is old hat to you. If you're new to Neo, these are the, the important concepts to understand. And. Here is uh, a visual model of that same simple model, or same simple get data model. This is done in arrows. You see, uh, just at a glance, person attends event, person works for company. You can see the property keys that are uh, appropriate to those nodes. So it's, it just gives you a quick, like at a glance, understanding of the model. So how does Cypher play into this concept of data modeling? So one of, the, one of the things that I showed from the, the original slide, when you're going through the process of building a graph, you start with your data sources on the left, and you're going to use, uh, you're going to construct what you call import cipher. So your create statements, your merge statements, those are going to pull data from your data sources, put it in your graph. And then on this side, when you're answering questions, you're going to use cipher again to construct analysis cipher, and you're going to get answers out of your graph. So if you had a data model you did in arrows or through like a partner tool or something like that, you could constrain the cipher using those node, node labels, the uh, relationship types, et cetera. And then you would uh, know how to write your cipher appropriately to, to both import and then uh, analyze the graph. The tool I've been working on lets you go the other way around. So if you are, say, like iteratively developing with cipher, or for me as a consultant, I come on site and I don't know what's going on. So people can just give me their cipher not even touching the graph. I mean, if they had the graph populated, fine, but if they're in the process of building the graph, like what are you trying to do? I can take a tool like this and I can see right away uh, what's, what's gonna, what they're trying to do and if they're doing it well. Here's um, just to look at an example of the import and the analysis cipher. Here we have import cipher where I'm importing myself as a node. You see everything that's in bold, this is the part of the cipher statement which is um, appropriate to the data model. So. Eric is a person, I have a property name, Graph Connect is an event, uh, attends, Eric attends Graph Connect. These are the things from the data model that are important. 
And on the, the, the fo on, at the end here, when I want to pull data back out, I'm using those same things, person attends event and the, the name properties to pull out. So you see this inter interplay between the import, or import side and the analysis side. So before I, I'm going to flip into the, the demo now, but um, it, one of the, my first example is this thing called the hero's journey. And uh, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, most of you probably aren't, but he uh, did some research and wrote a book about this, um, this th concept called the hero's journey, which is based on like Greek myth. And what essentially happens is there's a hero and the hero could be a man or a woman. Uh, and they, they, they live in this ordinary world and what they want to do is they get this, actually they get this call to adventure. And typically they're scared, they don't understand, so they refuse the call. And they meet some mentor, some, some wise person on the way, and the mentor like convinces them to go on the journey. And uh, so then on their journey, they, they, you know, battle, they overcome obstacles, uh, they uh, you know, get friends, they get some magical elixir or whatever. They come through uh, in full circle to return to the ordinary world as a changed person. And Christopher Vogler has updated this concept for like Hollywood screenplays and stuff like that. So these are kind of some archetypes. Anyway, the model I'm gonna have should look like a circle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you. So this is the tool I've been working on. Um, I don't know, let's see if it'll Did I narrow the screen. Hold on. Say again. Oh, mirror the screen. Okay, sorry about that. Give me one moment. In the range. All right, yeah. And then mirror. Got it. Okay, sorry about that. All right, there we go. Let me, let me go ahead and close that. Okay. So this is a tool I've been working on. Um, still a work in progress, but I've got a model view tab and a query view tab before I show the hero's journey. I have this little cipher statement down here, which shows, is this kind of from the movie example, uh, movie or actor, act in movie. I say parse cipher and, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong page. Parse cipher and we have, uh, there it goes, the, the visualization of actor, acted in movie. So now going up to this uh, hero's journey example, I have what I think should be a circle and so I'm going to post in here, and we should see a circle. And I'll parse the cipher. And alas, I knew this would happen. Uh, it's not a circle because I made mistakes in my cipher. And it may be difficult just by looking at the cipher. I didn't give you a lot of chance to look at the cipher. But you may not be able to tell when you're looking at long statements if there's a problem. So here, what happened is I started uh, in my ordinary world. I went to the call to adventure. I refused the call, but instead of meeting the mentor, I could also go back to the ordinary world, and I can't even get over here to the face of the ordeal. So right away, you can see this is kind of a, a visual way to look at is my cipher working, whether it's the import or the analysis side. Um, so in order to fix that, uh, you could modify the cipher, but uh, I've already got the, the correct version here. So I'll parse it, and let me do a little more layout. And now it looks much like a circle, the hero's journey, as it should. And you can see as I reap my reward, I return to my not so ordinary world at, at the bottom. Now the, the fun thing about this is, this is showing you the, the import cipher. What you can do is also say, well, hey, I wanna write a query that says, um, that shows me the, the quickest way to meet my mentor who's Emil. Well, it's not really my mentor, but yeah. for purposes of this demo, he is. So I'm gonna do this, the same thing, I'm gonna parse the cipher. It's the same exact model. There's nothing, um, there's nothing sort of new here from a, a data modeling perspective, but for every cipher statement that's in here, it's gonna show up in this little drop-down box. If I click on how do I meet Emil, it's gonna highlight the portion of the, the data model that's being used. So I can see right now at a glance that from the analysis side, this particular query is using like half the data model. So that's one, one kind of uh, good way you can actually see the context of analysis statements in the context of the overall data model you have. Um, now I'm going to move on to um, the next section. Let's see here. Are we I'm just going to skip over these because we demoed them. I can move forward. There we go. 
So one more thing about data modeling. The, the data models I showed you um, were, basically I was showing you ones where there's like a single view of like a node label. In this case, max, this is again a max reference. Um, this is done a few years ago using arrows, but he has this example of showing the structure of, I wanna see like airports and a flight between two airports. So I have airport listed twice and I have airport day listed twice. So this is kind of, I'm showing like uh, the model, but also with some structure. And so what I said is, can I, uh, so what I did, I just wrote a cipher statement that essentially mir mirrors that model, stuck on my tool, and then you see this particular uh, thing on, on the left there, which is what, what it looks like in the tool I'm working on. So with that being said, um, I'll show you, I don't know if you're familiar with this contest NASA's running. NASA is running a contest that if you can take carbon dioxide and other elements commonly found on Mars, like maybe water, and you can create glucose, then you're gonna get a lot of money. Uh, so with, <laughs> so with, with that, I have another example. We're gonna show um, some molecules here. And so I got my CO2, my water, let's see here. Oh, uh, uh, does it, okay, it does it, okay. All right, I'm gonna stop doing the slides then, I'll just, I'll just stick here. Eh, Re-mirror the screen. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. And I'm going to parse the cipher. So my model, um, I see hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. But it really doesn't show me enough information about the structure I'm looking for. So I do something like this. And then I can see the structure of my molecules where I have like water, uh, carbon dioxide and methane, for instance. And then I could also put in uh, glucose. We'll do that real quick. Hopefully my screen is still mirrored. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's do that. And if I do like a force layout, if you're interested in what glucose kind of looks like, kind of looks like that. So um, how am I doing on time? Five minutes? Okay. So the, the next section, the next demo, I'm not going to go back to the slides because of the screen mirroring problem. What I'll show you is there is um, a tool can just pick up Cypher wherever Cypher is laying around. And in uh, you know, Neo4j, there's a number of things called graph gist or graph gist, depending on how you say it. But there's a whole section of things related to like sports or you know, finance or pick your domain. There's graph gist that exists. And all of them have embedded Cypher. So what you can do is my tool will go through and rip all the cipher out, and then it will show you. Let me just like do this. And I will do like a side layout. So here, what's happening is this is um, from the Tour de France. So there's a Tour de France, which has uh, riders, a race, stages, it has cities, et cetera. So it just ripped through all the cipher, created a data model, and you can look at it right away what's happening. Now, this one's a little bit more detailed because some of the nodes are annotated with uh, little circles. For, for instance, like stage in the middle, I don't know if you can, let me see if I can zoom in some more. Uh, stage in the middle has two, three, four around it, and if you look at the far right, there's color codes that reference the actual data sources it came from. So this means that stage itself it has data that exists in three different files out of the four they're using to construct the data set. And it's also important because you see stage is sort of this central player to correlate the data amongst the different data sources. So th this lets you sort of start down the path of data lineage and look about you know, how is your, is your graph being sourced. Um, so there's that. And now I did tell you I was going to show you a little bit about cipher creation. So let me s delete this. It's not super sophisticated, but if you click on a node, <laughs> turn it blue, it will spit out Cypher for you in the bottom here. And essentially, it's very simplistic, but it'll take the, the node label, it'll convert it into a variable, and it'll stick, uh, you know, stick that here in this little Cypher editor like this, so like so. And you could even like make it, like you can say return, uh, return star, for instance. You can take this. Let's take it back over here, you can reparse it, and you see that it's just the little section of stuff you're working with. Now, how many, two minutes, maybe? I don't know. What's that? 
Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all in the browser. There's, there's no Neo4j database behind this. This is just all local parsing in the browser. The um, one thing I did on the train yesterday, which was uh, kind of falling or, or going down this concept a little more, is, is this. Um, I have a second version of the Tour de France uh, demo. I added one thing to it. I'm going to flip to this other particular view. And I'm going to parse the graph just, and you're going to see a few different things here. Um, let me do a side layout here. So the thing that's different here versus the other one, so you see some things are colored gray, and some of them have dashed lines. What that, and some of them are, are green. So you're like, what, what's, what's going on here? So here's the deal. So there's import cipher, which is when you're, you're essentially creating data in your graph. Then there's analysis cipher when you're looking for stuff in your graph to see what, what's in there. So anything that's colored gray, silid, that, um, that's stuff that is strictly in the import phase only. Uh, things that are like, like this mountain over here, which has a, a dashed line around it. That is a query that has no corresponding import statement. So it means data doesn't exist in the graph. You're not even putting data in the graph. And things that are green means that you're putting data in, you're looking for it. So the things that are green are kind of what you're looking for. Uh, things that are, are solid gray are things that essentially it's data that exists in the graph, maybe for future analysis, but you're not currently using it. And then things that are dashed gray are indicate a problem in that you shouldn't be looking for it because it doesn't exist. Uh, so it provides this sort of um, way to kind of, at a glance, look and see how your graph is being used. And that pretty much wraps up. I'll go back to the PowerPoint real quick, just for a quick wrap up. And if I can. So visualization is useful. You can understand Cypher at a glance. Uh, you can find graph disconnects. It does help with communications uh, in mid to large teams. For instance, if you have uh, teams that are split between doing import and analysis, then you can see it helps them like kind of coordinate with one another. You can also see the context. You can see your, um, it queries the subgraphs of your data model. I skipped over bullet four, but this is important. You can actually see and think of your models or your, or your Cypher queries as graphs themselves. Um, you can also see your, your graph data originated. And just a note about some of the tools used to build this. Open Cypher, very cool grammar. If you haven't checked it out, please check out Open Cypher on the opencypher.org statement. Uh, there's an Antler grammar file that you can use to, in this case, I generated a JavaScript parser that um, using the cypher.g4 grammar that is used for driving this tool. And then I just use D3 uh, for visualization of the tool. So that is it. And I will probably take any questions in the hallway, I think. Or is we have time for questions or? No, no time for questions. I'll take out in the hallway. So thank you very much.